Can, can you tell me about, you know, when you started listening to music and some of the first music that you remember hearing when you were young? My first, mu- well, the first music I heard, probably heard was my, both of my parents played piano in the house. But um, they both, they would play, I would be up in my bedroom at night and falling asleep to their piano playing beneath me. Wow. They, my mother, my father liked to play Scott Joplin ragtime music. And my mother played um, stuff like Bach and Beethoven and stuff like that. Wow. Sophisticated. Yeah. Well, ragtime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ragtime's more like, um, more, what's the word? Less sophisticated, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I heard Americana. that you. I, I know that you played piano. Did you play piano before you started playing guitar? Yes, I did. My mother was a, she was a journalist. That was her day job, her career. But <clears throat> she also, she had studied piano first in college. She was going to be a concert pianist before she um, decided that wasn't practical. And she then she became a journalism major. So she always was um, musical and she taught piano in our house um, in her free time. She taught piano lessons and she also directed the church choir and accompanied the choir on piano. So she she was my first piano teacher, I think. Wow. Yeah. So, so aside from what was going on in your house, were you listening to any music on the on a radio or yeah. buying vinyl or anything? Yeah, well, the first music I was listening to on my own was just like the the AM pop hit radio um, this, in the 70s, which was really the the stuff that probably stuck with me the most and, and you know, including stuff like ELO, whatever was on the radio, the AM pop hits radio was what I, I was listening to nonstop and I had the I had a little um transistor radio that I would bring into right. my bed with me and hold up to my ear and it was just like ma- I was like absorbing all this magical wonderfulness um in the dark at night, you know, just like I didn't I didn't even know necessarily what artists I was listening to. It was more like the songs were just transporting me. Like I had certain songs I felt were um so mystical and and like just like random stuff like the theme from mahogany by diana ross like, oh yeah oh, yeah going to? like that song used to just make me so happy hearing that and then just like everything on the radio like steve miller band and like um you know 70s stuff did, did you pick up the guitar like around this time like how old were you when you started playing the guitar well, I, I got, I had some, I had my um first desire for a guitar when I was about 10 years old and I started taking, I got an acoustic guitar at about 10, nine or 10. I started taking guitar lessons from my English teacher's son. Mr. Buechler was my favorite teacher <laughs> and he had a son named David Buechler who who um taught piano out of their home and so I went over there and that was kind of torture though he because he made me sing the the piano teacher he taught me the basic open chords you know like an A chord a G chord an E chord and, and then he taught me a few songs like leaving on a jet plane and then he made me sing it while I played the chords which at that time was torture for me because I I was so shy and I had never really sung in front of I was in choirs but I had never sung in front of anyone on my own so I was more like I kind of didn't like the guitar lessons because of that but I did learn open chords and then later in high school I had a friend teach me how to play bar chords and then I was like oh I get it this is rock and roll I get it it's so easy and then and later in college, I, I, um, well, it's a kind of long story, but I got, I decided I wanted to be in a band, but I was really pathologically shy and I didn't know how. So I thought, oh, I'll go to a music college. I'll, I'll find a band there. So I went to Berkeley and I, um, I got in as a piano student. And oh, interesting. Yeah. Cause I had all the training and, 
and then I once I, I had one semester studying piano and then I switched over to vocal department study started studying voice and started learning how to play electric guitar got my first electric guitar in my first year at Berkeley I imagine that you started writing songs pretty right away. I get the I was, feeling. I was writing songs back as early as nine years old, I remember. Well, <laughs> you really, my mother told me that I used to sing in the car and I would make up songs about the landscape we were passing through. Mm -hmm. you know, I would make up songs, I would improvise, I would, I would turn the situation being a passenger in the car into a song and I would just start singing about being in the car and what we were seeing and and you know like uh, whatever that was that was my first songwriting I believe it was not recorded or written but right. I had now, an, an instinct to sing about my life from a very early age I, I had the, the body of work you have I believe it now you yeah. mentioned Berkeley and that's when you met uh John and Frida at Berkeley when, when did you start that's where you met them right and you started yes. playing with them pretty soon after that yeah the first night they they came and they knocked on my dorm room door and they said um hey do you want to sing in our band <laughs> they had seen me around campus <laughs> and they thought I looked cool and I had seen them too and I thought they looked cool but I was too shy to know how to strike up a conversation so thankfully they came and they um they literally knocked on my door and they invited me over to their apartment to jam and they had an apartment a little top floor corner apartment on Hemingway Street which was mm -hmm. just like do you know the area the Fenway right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So it was basically like what the I was in a dorm on Mass Ave and across Mass Ave um you'd go down this little street and then you hit Hemingway Street so it was just like right down the street from me. And we went up and I was just learning how to play guitar, electric guitar. And Frida was just learning how to play drums. And we just played through some simple like Velvet song, Velvet Underground song. Mm. And maybe uh, something by R.E.M. Like we all loved R.E.M. Like something simple like Radio Free Europe or something. Did, did like they already... Songs. Did they already have the name Blake Babies at that point? Yeah, they, they, ha did. they had the name, they had the concept, and they needed a singer. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, now you met Evan Dando pretty close to around that time, didn't you? Yeah, the, so the Blake Babies started writing songs and getting gigs together soon. And the Lemonheads were also just starting out. And I we went to... The, Frida and John and I went to a record store in Kenmore Square. I think it was probably like Nuggets or something. Mm -hmm. And we we were, we found this seven inch in the singles bin, and it was the Lemonheads' first single or three song thing called um, "Laughing All the Way to the Cleaners." Yeah, we thought it looked cool, so we bought it and we listened to it and we loved it. And then we saw that they were playing in boston i think it may be at tt the bears and we went to see them play and we introduced ourselves i actually i don't remember the deep i don't know, remember what club it was but we met them at a gig and they came to see us play and it was just like instantly we, we liked each other and we all became friends and and it was a beautiful relationship with all, among all of us yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 I was going to ask you, and I will ask you. You know, I know you made four albums with Blake Babies, and then you played on "It's a Shame About Ray." Now, were you really considered an official member of the band at that time, or did you just play on the record? I I I was still doing my own thing, so I just I just went to play on the record, and um, yeah, I was I was never an official member of the band. And the photo on that record is kind of a joke. It's it's kind of a goof. Like they, mm -hmm. um, Dave and Evan had, I think they each had a beer and a cigarette. And I, I didn't drink or smoke, but I was like, give me a beer and a cigarette and I'll be like <laughs> one of the band. <laughs> so that's how that photo happened. Now, um, now, did you like, I'm going to move along quickly because you have a huge body of work here. So um were you still playing with Evan when you recorded Hey Babe or you or were you like were you doing both things at once or had you already moved on from that? Um 
Oh no, I maybe came before to shame about Ray. I think. God, my timeline's all screwed up. But I me think, too. Yeah, so I I feel like it's a shame. I mean, sorry. Hey babe, happened the Blake the Blake babies broke up, and then I recorded Hey babe, and Evan played and sang on that a bunch along with the, a lot of other guests. Yeah, yeah, you assembled quite a, a group of musicians on that record. How were you able yeah. to do that? Did you have well, help from the studio people? No, it was like, it was just my friends, you know, like, um, and the Blake Babies had done some gigs with Firehose, Mike Watts band. So yeah. my kid kind of become a friend. And, and so I asked him and then John Wesley Harding, who is now known as Wesley Stace, was a friend of my manager and the guy who was he wasn't maybe he wasn't my manager yet but he was he was producing hey babe because gary smith yeah he was the, the late dude. gary smith yeah yeah the, the late great gary smith he he started fort apache studio so i was recording in there and he knew wes wesley stays so he came in sang and then yeah all the people were just like, Todd you know like all the people were basically just friends of mine and i got i wanted to get as many friends in as i could because i felt really scared and lonely scared and alone after breaking up the blake babies which was like my gang you know yeah i just got friends in to help me so after you did those you know the four albums with blake babies and lemon heads and hey babe then it was the juliana juliana hatfield three with todd and uh dean, dean. todd was on my show by the way not too oh, long yeah, ago he told me. and I tanya ha- dean's wife tanya yeah, both of them. But the funny thing about Todd was he has one of the best memories of anyone I've oh ever Oh my God, I know. To. He and John Strom both can remember everything. And they remember things that have t- completely dis- disappeared from my mind, completely. Yeah, I was blown away by his memory for sure. Yeah. Now, um, things happen really quickly after that. And it's really pretty well documented you're, that you're a, pretty, you're a private person and you're kind of like a loner. I, I'm like a loner myself. So I get that, you know, was it difficult with all the attention from become what you are, you know, with MTV and my so-called life, the spin cover, you know, all this stuff that happened, was that hard for you? It was so difficult and it's hard to explain to people because people think that, oh, that's, you're living the dream. You're living the dream. All You're having quote unquote success. You're being, you know, you're getting a lot of attention from the press. And for me, it was really difficult, kind of a nightmare actually. Um, Cause you know, I was like, I don't know. I felt kind of autistic. I don't like to throw that term around because it's a real diagnosis mm-hmm. but I had just very very always had a very hard time socially interacting with people and then to be thrust into this into all these situations that I felt so completely like a fish out of water you know just being interviewed being on camera um being photographed I just felt like fish out of water is the apt metaphor I did not really adjust very well to any of those situations and uh, you know all I ever wanted was to make music because I had such a hard time communicating in real life and then I was for me the the making of music somehow forced me to have to try to communicate more in all the other ways that were impossible for me other than music you know the music was not sufficient to communicate I was made to ha- communicate in other ways you know yeah and i could tell that you you didn't do a lot of video interviews later on in your career like the last 20 years you've been on tv a few times on like boston tv stations because i find i looked for clips but there's not very many but yeah. i how did how did they get you to do my so-called life that must have been a, a kind of a shocking situation for you well initially it was really cool because um the show was just beginning and they had they had shot some episodes and they sent me they sent me the episodes they had put together um they sent me a video cassette so I could watch the show and I and I thought it was such a great kind of innovative original Mm -hmm. show and they initially they were asking me to write a song for this character who would be the homeless angel to sing I guess the character was as yet uncast and so I met I went to I went to meet with um 
the show people, the show, I guess now they will call her a showrunner, Winnie Holtzman. And she, and she was so great. And we, we talked about the song they wanted me to create. Um, and it was, they gave me very, very good guidelines. It was meant to be, you know, kind of a Christmas song, kind of sad. Mm -hmm. kind of and they, they had examples of some, like jo Joni Mitchell's River, which... Mm. Kind of a sad song, but it utilized the melody of um, Jingle Bells in the minor key, minor key, you know, like da, 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 on the piano. And so, wait, is that what it is? Sorry. <laughs> I want to make sure I get that right. Do, 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 do. Yeah, so, so the idea was I would somehow write a kind of sad but pretty Christmas song, but not an outright Christmas, Christmas song, but I could subtly you know, have hints, Christmas hints in there. And which I did, I made the song and I really, I recorded it and I really liked it. The song called Make It Home. And it was it had to do with the Christmas episode, which had to do with this character being kind of like pushed out of his home. And um, anyway, I'm not telling the story very well, but I guess after they met That's me- That's okay. Five, sorry. <laughs> after they met me, the show people met me, they thought that I might be right to play the character who was going to sing the song. Wow. Um, so I didn't know how I didn't know how to act. Yeah. So that was that was another um thing, a situation in which I felt kind of like, what am I doing? How do I do this? But they were they were really great the director was so helpful and all the actors on the set were really helpful and they helped me to just like get it done and then, yeah you didn't really have aspirations to become an actress or anything like that no I had, yeah. I had taken a few acting classes and my friend Phil Morrison had cast me in this um episode of a show called Pete and Pete and yeah I, I played a lunch lady and I think I did one other thing but yeah and acting did not come naturally for me and you know in all the the rock videos I've done I felt really awkward and so I tried you know I tried a few act, little acting gigs like my so-called life and ultimately I came to the conclusion that I, I don't get it like I don't I don't really understand acting yeah, I understand. I, I mean, I've I've read enough of your interviews to know that you prefer the more private kind of life. Um, it's been like thir it's been thirty years or something like that since become what you are. Todd had mentioned that there might be a tour celebrating that record. Is that a possibility, or was he just I'm guessing? Like, become what you are. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. What did I say? No, I think no. I was sorry. I was zoning out because um, I was thinking about the plan we have, which is. Yes, we we have a plan to tour next June, I think. Wow. It'll be like it's it'll be billed as the 30th anniversary, but it might be actually like the 31st or something <laughs> by that time. Yeah. Um so maybe we'll actually maybe we'll bill it as the 31st anniversary. But yeah, we're we're the plan tentative plan is to go on the road next in a, you know, next June ish. Play wow, that'll, that'll be cool. Album. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, since 1993, you've had one of the more prolific, I, that's the best way I can describe you, careers when it comes to writing songs or releasing records. I know it's somewhere over 20 albums. I love your work ethic. I'm also going to add consistent to prolific. Yeah. How do you do How do you do it? I mean, you put a record out almost every single year. How do you get yourself i mean is this like the only thing that really matters to you i know you have a dog or maybe uh, you had a dog at one point I'm, i imagine you still do i dog, mean the dog died in march actually oh so, i am sorry yeah, thanks she did she passed away um april may june, wait april may june july four four and a half months ago five, oh, five months sorry ago. yeah she was old she got cancer yeah it was awful um so yeah, I do. I well, for, from my perspective, I actually feel lazy. I feel like a really lazy person because you know, like I sit, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking I finished my 
my last album, my new album, the ELO covers, mm -hmm. I finished that months ago. I finished it and I haven't written anything in months. And for me, that's like, what am I doing? I'm sitting on my ass. I'm, I mean, I'm doing things, but I'm not writing. I'm trying to start writing now, but I could put out two albums a year if I tried. I could. So I love I it. I think I'm lazy, but wow, I'm, but, I I don't think you're lazy. My, when you said that, you can't see my face, but I was like bewildered actually, by the fact that you yeah, think I, you're lazy. But I well, you were saying I have a dog, and I but I the fact is that I always pretty much always lived alone. I don't have kids. I don't have a husband. I don't have a partner, and so I do have this time, a lot of time for myself. So. I use the time to work on music. That's so I have the time and the space and the freedom to do you that. You do art too, right? You're an artist yeah. as well, right? Yeah. I, I I did I went to art school and I do I do draw draw mostly now. I haven't been painting, but um I do I do, do that a lot, yeah. You, you've played with so many incredible musicians and I can't name them all, but you know, Evan, Todd, Dean, Ed V, Mikey Welsh, the late Mikey Welsh, Pete Caldez, he's on a ton of your records, Chris Anzalone. How do you decide from record to record who will be playing with you or even touring with you? Like sometimes you even do the whole record yourself, like Peace and Love and I think Wild Animals, yeah. I think you played alone. Is yeah. there a method to your madness? I don't mean madness in a negative way, yeah. but I mean, I looked at, when you go, th I have several of your records and I can't believe, I love a lot of these people too. I think that the bass players you've had are all great. Pete Caldez, he's such a great in the pocket Pete. drummer. Todd, I mean, how do you do it? It's there is no method to my madness. Madness. It's so. It's so random. Like. When I was making the. Police covers album, I was, talking to Ed about it. Ed Velasquez, and I was asking him if he wanted to play some bass on it. And I was gonna play some drums myself. You know, I I, I like to start songs sometimes, at home with a drum machine beat. And then sometimes I'll add some of my own drumming on top of it. But with the police songs, there were some songs that needed another drummer. I was not going to be able to um, be enough of a drummer. So I asked Ed, it's like, Ed, hey, you want to play bass on a few police songs? And by the way, I need a drummer. Do you know anyone who's available? And he, and he said, yeah. Uh, well, might, I might have said first, is, I might have thought of Pete first, Pete Caldas, but he was not available and then I asked Ed do you know any drummers that could come in the studio and play on a few police songs around this time period and he's like yeah I know this guy Chris Anzalone and so I was like fine and then I went to the studio I trusted Ed you know that I yeah. trust I trust Ed that okay. he, he's not going to deliver a crappy drummer so I mean deliver that sounds so impersonal but um so I, I know what you mean because I know Ed well. He's a great guy and he definitely knows his shit. No yeah, doubt. So he knew what was he knew what I needed. It was just this these police songs and um so I went and I met Chris Anzalone in the studio at the time of the that we were gonna start recording and we just like he had I guess I had given him um the song, the I the song titles of the police songs that I needed him to play drums on, one of which was, um, we were gonna do, I was doing a fast version of Murder by Numbers and I felt like that would be a good test of Chris to start. I think we started with this fast version, kind of punk version of Murder by Numbers and Chris did it great, it was fine. And he ended up like playing on a few of the police songs and he did great and that's how I met him. Well, wow. yeah, and some of the other people that you played with, I mean, I know you did a lot with Pete and Mikey Welsh also, you know. I mean, these guys are some of my favorite musicians, you know. And yeah, Mikey I, was such a great bass player. He was a good rock bass player. Yeah. Yeah, I and I know that. he's you know, the boss, you know, he lived in the Cambridge area also, so. Yeah. I don't um, remember how I met Mikey. I did, it was probably just like he might have been a friend of, Todd, 
I don't remember, but it was all the, it seems like all the musicians I play for, I, I mean, I play with, it's all kind of just like random meetings or like chant, you know, like I need, can you come and play in, in this gig or in this studio day? I need someone and it, and it you like works out or it doesn't. Yeah, I'm not going to say you're. I'm not going to say you were. You're lucky, but I'm going to say you definitely. It. It. The pieces always seem to fall together. Yeah, and, and it's, sometimes it's sometimes it's really just like, I want to play. I want to go on the road with friends, and I don't really like they're the way they play isn't as important as how comfortable I feel with them, and like that's why Todd is maybe not. Um, the style of drummer that I would necessarily gravitate toward. He's very, very like rock. <laughs> R-A-W-K. Rock <laughs> drummer. Yeah. And but I'm so comfortable being around Todd. Like we get along great and it's so easy for me. And it's not always easy for me. Um I'm very like ultra sensitive to everyone around me and Oh, there's a, I often feel very a lot of anxiety just around certain people's energy but with Todd I'm just very comfortable and that's so important to me when being in the studio and on the road and he's just so he's a great guy and he's really he's so smart and he's so funny and that's really important to me yeah I can imagine because you're in a van probably I know I'm yeah. sure you probably yeah. had a bus at one point but I imagine you're doing van tours now right yeah all van, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned Pete and Ed must have been really easy because those guys played together for so long that they're just locked in with each other. So, yeah. I mean, the thing about Pete Caldez, he never overplays. That's what I love about him. He's just always in the pocket, you know? Yeah, Pete's a great drummer. He did so, he did great on my Pussycat album and the Olivia and John record. And it's like, yeah, you don't have to worry about the drums being um, um, inappropriate or sticking out in a weird way. They're just like, it's just like very good. Um, what's the word? Like cl classy drumming. Yeah, I had to bring this up because I think you have great people on all your records. Um, uh, I want to talk about what I'm just going to call the trilogy. <laughs> you uh -huh. know, Olivia Newton-John, The Police, and now EL and ELO. Very ambitious, to say the least. What made you choose these artists? Was it a reaction from the reception that you got from that? I think it was 2012, you did that covers album. Is that yeah. what led you in this direction? No, I think, um, well, Olivia Newton-John, she was always such a huge inspiration to me. I always loved her. when I And I I identified with her. And when, I, when Grease came out, I really identified with the character of Sandy. Um, you know, I always felt like I was kind of an innocent among um, among rascals. I don't know, like all the people that I was drawn to were kind of like the I don't know drug the drug in high school, like the druggies and the punks. And actually, that's not true. I was I had a <laughs> wide range of friends I never felt like well I never felt like I wanted to hang around with the virgins and the teetotalers like I didn't necessarily want to hang around with people like me who who were innocent but I was I was interested in people who were exploring their dark sides and you know I so I'm not explaining this very well but I am um, related to the character Sandy so much and I just love, I always loved Olivia Newton-John's voice and her songs and her, her whole general vibe. It was very, it was very wholesome and yet honest and authentic. And it wasn't like she was trying to pretend or to ham it up in front of, in front of an audience. You had a sense of like her, her really honest grace and, um, interesting I, yeah i really i just i don't know i I, just, I was very and that means you want to listen to her music more well no it wasn't it was her voice i loved her voice it was a beautiful beautiful voice and her songwriters she didn't she had a lot of you know 
people, she had songwriters around her that um, this guy, John Farrar was an amazing songwriter. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I just like was very drawn to her. And then around before I started making the album, I, she, she, there was news that she, her cancer had come back. She had battled yeah. cancer in the past and she was in remission. And then the word was that her cancer had come back. And I was like, oh, wow, damn, I should go. I got to, I should go try to see her play. She was going on the road again and I had never seen her live. And so a friend of mine got tickets to see her on this. I think it became, it, it turned out to be her last tour. And I was like, she's her cancer's back. Who knows what will happen? I got to go wow. see her. So we went, we got tickets. I got tickets to see her in the place that was closest to me, which was the way like tertiary market in Pennsylvania, not even Pittsburgh. It was like outside of Pittsburgh. So I flew there and my friend flew from North Carolina and we met and we went to see Olivia and John play and it was great. And I was so glad I did it. And then I think that was what inspired me to make the album. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to just pay tribute to her and her legacy, which had meant so much to me. Really, I just wanted to express my love and share the love and, and take it really seriously. Cause I, I, I was thinking that, you know, I was thinking about her legacy cause she was, you know, her cancer had come back and what was she going, you know, how was she going to be remembered? And I, and I knew that there were people out there who thought of her as this cupcake, like a sugary cupcake that had no substance. And I, and I felt like, that's just the wrong way to look at her. And I wanted to, sh I wanted to um, explore her range as a vocalist and which turned out to be very challenging for me. I, trying to sing some of the songs was very difficult because she had a really wide range and her, her voice was very powerful, actually. I love what you did with it. I, I I love what you did with the record. I mean, I, I I'm not I'm I'm not a I wasn't a huge Olivia Newton John fan. It's not that I didn't like her or anything. I'm more like into like you know indie punk metal everything, but like mainstream. But I thought you did a fantastic job physical, especially when I heard that. I was like, wow! I actually was put it on playlists and stuff. You know? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I like I I like to um I I may. I like to make the songs my own in a way. So I, 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 I'm not trying to just play someone else's songs. I like to try to make them feel like I play them a bunch of times until they start to take on new shapes and or feel new feels. And that's what happened with physical. It just became something different. Like it became a really serious song for me. It was about, you know, um, how uncomfortable lust can be and how how destructive a force it can be. That's what the song became for me. Wow. Now with the police, I imagine, you know, to the police was that you you kind of changed up their songs a little bit too, your arrangements. I mean, was that more difficult than Olivia Newton John? No, the police was a much easier really for me. Yeah, because well um, Olivia Newton John's voice was was technically much more um, agile than my voice, or more she she could do more with her voice than I can. Like my technical instrument is not that strong, um, and her voice is like going all over the place and complicated. But with Sting, I felt like much more of a um, affinity for his phrasing and his range and I I was mm. in a cover band in high school and I sang we sang a lot of I sang a lot of police in the cover band you were wow. yeah and, and Sting Sting's singing in the police to me it's like putting on a glove that fits really well and it was just it's very it's almost like and I knew all the songs so well it's almost like second nature to me to sing the police songs and almost like I don't even have to think about it much much easier much more simple than singing Olivia Newton-John songs for sure yeah um 
with the ELO, the new album that's coming in November, uh, you said that you um, identify with the loneliness. I'm going to quote you. You identify with the loneliness and alienation and the outer space in this i don't know if that's a word but in the songs that you choose can you elaborate on that a little bit um yeah well i i mean obviously they used to have yeah they have spaceships on their (laughs) you know album art and they had i reportedly they had spaceship on stage when they were touring the big places so yeah and there's a lot of there's just a lot of songs about feeling um the songs I am drawn to of ELOs are the ones that talk about alienation, um, feeling like it's really hard to connect, connect with other people. That just that that alienated vibe. And and um and I also I just have this thing about outer space I feel like an alien myself I feel like I might be part Vulcan or something like I was I was transported down to earth from my real planet and I I'm not really answering the question though in terms of specific ELO songs um I'm trying to I'm trying to find the track listing of my album so I can answer your question but I can't find it it was I was more interested with the the loneliness and the alienation part well you know the stuff like that's how i feel i feel very alienated from the rest of humanity i always have i feel i feel like you know like song like telephone line just Mm. connected or a song like um strange magic feeling like you know other people are are strange and and weird and I, i don't i feel like a different species and um about and I've always kind of felt like that hard to connect with other people but I feel like the connection I do make is a musical one and that's it's just really important to yeah me. and I get that in the music of ELO there's certain songs just transport me to that that space that otherworldly um area that where I feel comfortable yeah, I was happy when they finally recognized Jeff Lynn and put him in the hot Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all that, you know, because he's definitely yeah. one of the greats as a producer as well. Oh, he's like a genius producer. Like, I, I, it would be such a dream to be produced by him. I was going to ask you if you thought you would you would, would work well with him in the studio. I'd imagine you you would say yes. I would love that. I would just really like give up the reins totally to him if that could ever happen. Yeah. Here's kind of a different kind of question. Uh, you released Weird after the, the Olivia Newton-John record and Blood. I love that record. I have it on vinyl. Uh, after the Police record, does that mean we're going to have a new original album after the ELO record? That Yeah, that's the plan. I'm starting to work on writing it now. Yeah, an original. And I'm already, and then I'm planning the next Cars album after the original. Cars. Oh my God. That's Wait, what? Like, what did you say? Did you say the Cars? No, no, no. Sorry. I said the next Covers album. Oh. Covers. It's not, I thought, no. I mumble. Sorry. Wow. I thought you were going to do a Cars. Uh, but I thought, record. I actually, I did consider the Cars, but I think. I think not. Not at this time. Not the Cars. Wow. I can't. I, I have a feeling there will be another one. I can't. Can hardly wait. Yeah. Um, okay, this is kind of weird too. You know, I put together a list of my favorite songs that you've written in no particular order, just because mm-hmm. I wanted to just share them with you. And because I was going to ask you if you had favorites, this list is not in any order at all. So it's kind of random. Dirty mm-hmm. Dog from In Exile Deo. I love that song. Mm-hmm. Supermodel, early one. Just Lust. Mm-hmm. I, the minute I heard it, I was like, brilliant. Prettiest Girl, which I know is a Some Girls um, a song from Feel It. I meant to mention to you how much I love those two records, too, by the way. Because Everybody Loves Me But You, very early. And then All Right, Yeah, on the Weird record. The first time I heard that song, I was like, this song's brilliant. Thank and of you. course, I love like you know some of your covers, too. Like Lot of Love, I thought was really good. So I know Thank that's you. a weird list, but no, it's cool. That's just some those are some deep cuts. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you appreciate them. 
Yeah, I'm not, I mean, you know, I mean, I like My Sister and, and you know, all those, the hit songs too, but I thought some of these other tracks are like brilliant. Dirty Dog, I the minute I heard it, I was like, wow, this is like really a rocking song, you know, for, for you know, because you're more like, to me, like more of indie. I mean, I know people call you indie rock and I know you can rock, but that song was just something about it. I can't explain it. It just really hit me. Thank you. That was a really, um, it started off as a really literal take on something that someone said to me. Um, a friend of mine was just talking about how a friend was staying with him at his house and his friend had a dog and the friend had taken the dog out in the rain or in the mud and then he brought the dog back into his house and <laughs> it got mud and dirt all in the gut in my friend's house and my friend was talking about it, like oh really this guy's really cool I really like him but I'm not down with the dirty dog you know I wanted like, oh, to no. ask you I, I wanted to ask you so bad what that song was about because there are so <laughs> many different things it could be about yeah well I, I took that line I'm like I'm not down with the dirty dog that's a great chorus <laughs> and then I just started to think how can I expand on that idea? And I thought like, oh, like it can be a song about all these ridiculous um, like aggravations and abuses that I will tolerate, you know, in a really dysfunctional relationship, but I'll put my foot down at the, the dirty dog. I love it. So, um, that's what that's all I got. And I was going to ask you what's next, but I think you already answered that question. You know, you're going to do another solo record and who knows who's going to play on it. Whoever's around, I guess. Right. Yeah. Or it might end up being a, a acoustic album that I make at home. I'm not Ooh, sure. Yet. Yeah. That... I feel like it might be time to kind of go there again. Um, or, you know, electric guitar. I'm thinking of something really pretty with, guitars and mellotron flutes and a lot of layered vocals and then sounds... I'm, I'm also going to do some show going to be doing some shows in the fall that's we're still finalizing those but there i'll be going out there um with the elo record a little bit but i'm i'm going to be going doing it mostly on my own solo shows you're good at it you're good thank at everything you, you do Jul juliana and um thank you thank so much Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of yours, if you haven't figured that out yet. And I'm. it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. You take care. Bye.